Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Um, this is weird because I'm recording our usual Monday show, not on a Sunday like I usually do, but on a, I've lost track of days, on a Thursday. So Jeremy Cohen, my co-host, I feel like I just talked to you. It was like a couple of days ago, and now I'm talking to you again. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, well, we recorded on a Friday you know, a couple times ago. We, oh, yeah, we haven't been true. on our consistent Sunday schedule, which is weird because today should be an off day. It should be an off day. But it's not. But it's this not. weekend will be. Um, Andrew and I are both separately going on vacations, and uh, we're able to do this before any of us leave. So it's great. It is great. Um, I am not going on a vacation, which sucks for me. I'm very jealous of both of you, but that's fine. Um, we, 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 we could deal. Um, so if any massive Knicks related news happens on Friday, Saturday or Sunday, and you don't hear us talk about it right now, that is why, but I'm sure I'll do some kind of a live stream to make up for it. But I, I have a feeling nothing breaking is going to happen, right? It's the combine, right? Or combine. I mean, yeah, you know, like our breaking news right now is like so-and-so interviewed with the Knicks, which, you know. Who cares? Yeah. Um, today's topic, though, is very interesting, much more interesting than who the Knicks interview at the combine, because um, as we have been dancing around for seemingly months and months and months, um, this free agency group, class, cohort, whatever word you want to use, kind of sucks, especially when you talk about what the Knicks need. Um, Kawhi, he ain't going anywhere. Chris Paul, love you, Chris Paul. He ain't going anywhere. Um, and everybody else that's available for the most part is just, it's not really checking all the boxes for the Knicks with one exception. And we're going to talk about him today. Do you want to say who we're going to talk about, Jeremy? I mean, I could. I could also just let the PowerPoint oh, do God. the talking. <laughs> I, I shouldn't even host the show anymore. It should just be the PowerPoint. The Knicks Film School podcast hosted by Jeremy's PowerPoint. Yeah. And w- what am I looking at right now? I'm looking at the name of the player we're going to talk about today. Kyle Lowry. Yes. Surrounded by. I'm wondering if I'm missing the joke here. Those are peach emojis, John. They are peach emojis. Do you know what peach emojis can represent? A big a ass? Yes. Yeah. Uh, got a big what... ass. See, this is now two podcasts in a row. I get to say that. It's great. She, she's Perfect. got a great ass. That's, <laughs> yeah, the, best. that's the correct one. That's yes. the best thing. So, uh, um, yeah. So, so the Knicks have all the money in the world and all the need in the world to sign both Kyle Lowry and Kyle Lowry's giant ass this summer. Yes. And that is what we are it's going a package to package deal. It's it is a pa- you can't have one physically. You cannot have one. I wonder if remember when you used to hear about like Jennifer Lopez would get insurance taken out on her. Was it her ass or was it some other part of her body? It's probably her. Might have been. Might have been. I think it was her ass. I wonder if Kyle Lowry got insurance for his ass, like for in the un- unfortunate event of anything ever happened to it. I hope so. For his sake, at least. For his sake, because he's worthless without his ass. As you say, it's a package deal. Before we actually talk about the contract stuff, just very briefly, what are your, like, general, because Kyle Lowry's been around for a while. What are your, like, general impressions of him as, like, I don't want to say that we don't have to get into, like, a historical discussion, but just, like, when you hear the name Kyle Lowry, like, what do you think of? I think of a really talented point guard. One who, you know, I mean, he obviously won a title with Toronto, but someone who for years has been, undervalued and underrated in a lot of ways. And now that he's hitting the free agent market, I think we're starting to see his value creep back up. The problem is that he is at a more advanced age. He's 35. So there's a reason why we're even talking about him becoming available because for all of these players, there seems to be a caveat and his caveat happens to be that he is on the older side. He is 14 years older than RJ Barrett, for example. But Hey, I mean, Chris Paul is like 14 years older than DeAndre Ayton, you know, somewhere in that range. So yeah. who knows? You never know. But I, I think, you know, he's a, he's what you want in a point guard in so many ways. He's a winning player yeah. by all intents and purposes. And he's fantastic. Uh, it's really just a matter of how he fits the timeline, what the timeline is and, and, if he can still, you know, be himself. Toronto was definitely tanking. It was worth it. They 
nabbed the fourth pick in the draft by jumping mm-hmm. a few spots, which is great for them. Yep. But, you know, Lowry didn't play in a lot of those games. Was it mostly because of the Raptors being like, we're in Tampa and we'd rather just tank the season? Was it also his age? Is it somewhere in the middle? I'm not really sure, but you still have to go into it with the thought of his past has been fantastic. What are his present and future going to look like? And, and how is that going to affect everything else? Um, three really quick things before we get into the contract stuff. One, um, you said the word that it comes to my mind when I think of Kyle Lowry, which is that he's a winner, which is ironic because for a lot of years there, I think he was painted as a guy who kind of came up small um, in situations. And it's funny because you could look back at his stats at a lot of those playoff series and make that argument. But even just as an outsider looking in, I always looked at him as a guy that if I am trying to win games, like, like I, he's just a guy that you want on your team. If you're, if you're trying to win games, second thing I'll say in just in terms of body type, um, you know, even joking aside about his, <laughs> his large uh, derriere, the donk donk like He is, I think I, like, I don't look at his body type and get too, too worried about, the the or as worried about the aging curve um you know he's always been i mean he, even since he first came into the league he's been a guy a guy a guy that's one with like guile and um you know grit and kind of um toughness and obviously he leads the league in charges every charges drawn every year um and obviously the shooting component matters a lot um you know he doesn't have chris paul level vision but you know it's pretty pretty solid and then the third thing speaking of chris paul that i want to say is for anybody who, you know, was concerned before the season about the Knicks potentially trading for Chris Paul because like, oh, you're just going to bring in Chris Paul and then you're going to be good for a couple of years and then Chris Paul goes away and like, where are you? Um, take a look at the Suns, you know, kind of sort of dismantling, dismantling. Uh, well, not dismantling. That's a little bit too strong of a word. But, you know, they won the first two games of the Western Conference Finals against, granted, a Kawhi-less Clippers team, but that same Kawhi-less Clippers team dispatched Utah. Um, No Chris Paul um, is the reason that the Suns have been able to do what they have done now um, over to start the Western Conference Finals because of Chris Paul's like, you know, magic influence. No, Um, those players like got better and worked harder and DeAndre Ayton has progressed and like the Booker, all these guys have progressed. But like, sure, Chris Paul had a lot to do with that. So I think if ever that argument kind of was going to go by the wayside, it's it's now after watching what has happened with, with Phoenix. So, like, all due respect to the timeline question, like, I, I don't care about it that much. Like, if you could get Kyle Lowry on a good number, which is what we're going to talk about today, go ahead and get Kyle Lowry on a good number. And then, you know what? Let the chips fall where they may. Sure. Again, I as we will see soon, um, it's more a question of how you still line things up because with the Suns, I mean, they had Devin Booker, Mikhail Bridges, uh, DeAndre Ayton. And all of those players have taken a step forward this year. And it's not to say that there are various Knicks who cannot, but you know, it's going to be Julius Randall, RJ Barrett, and you hope Emmanuel quickly, but you know, if he, if he doesn't, or if one of them doesn't necessarily take that leap, then you're a very good team, but you're not necessarily in that upper echelon. And the advantage I think that the Suns also have is a lot of their players are closer to their prime than the Knicks. So, I mean, you could, you could say, um, that Obi is, is closer to Mikhail, but Mikhail is also uh, in terms of age and, and where they're drafted or like a um, Cam Johnson, they try, you know, he was older when he was drafted. Sure. Yeah. But those are like, those are perimeter players who are, have been able to kind of be great role players and advanced into other things as well. And it's also a well-built like Obi, team. Uh, right. The Suns. Yeah, exactly. Where someone like Obi is more of a late bloomer who just needs more time to fit into the role that I think the Knicks have in mind for him. So it's like if the Knicks had a McHale type player, if they had picked McHale in uh, 2018, for example, then maybe it's a different story here, but it's not. This is what we've got. Of course, there is a trade market out there. There are other free agents who we will mention uh, as probably the perfect segue. So, uh, John, for our first free agent. Yes. Um, he's a former teammate of Kyle Lowry's. What was your mindset in terms of pairing Kyle Lowry with DeMar DeRozan? So again, as just as a reminder to anyone who may have missed the last episode, we're we're not only picking the free agent, which is Kyle Lowry, that's he's the free agent of the week, but we're picking a different person to pair, three different people to pair him with. My mindset with with DeRozan is pretty simple. Um, I think DeRozan, and this may be famous last words, we went without knowing what he'll get this summer, has kind of become an undervalued asset. 
um, in the NBA. And it's because he's old. Um, he doesn't have, he's a wing who can't shoot the three or shouldn't shoot the three because um, he's not proficient from there. And uh, he also, you know, he's the guy who I think the playoff shrinking knocks are legitimate, more certainly more legitimate than, than Lowry. But in fairness, when has DeRozan ever been on a playoff team where he wasn't the number one or the number two guy? My thinking here is that if he comes to the Knicks, he's not the number one guy. He's not the number two guy. He's not the number three guy. He's all of a sudden the number, the number four in the totem pole. And I, I, I think, you know, the chemistry obviously is there. I think at some point you just kind of look at a guy and it's like, is he a good basketball player or is he not a good basketball player? DeMar DeRozan is a good basketball player. He, he helps the flow of the offense. He's obviously, he was had averaged almost eight assists or seven assists a game last, last season with San Antonio. Um, super efficient, obviously, mostly inside the arc, but still. Um, and I just think, like, you know, it's a good team. It's a good team. And it's not, well, we'll see what the numbers are that we have come up with. But I don't think with these signings together, you're necessarily boxing yourself into a corner. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think, oh, actually... Before I should do that, before we get into, I forgot that this, I snuck this in here. How, you know, is, I know, is I'm this the your worst. first rodeo here? It clearly is. Um, clearly. I guess I want to just bring a quick landscape to what the free agency is, um, just in the sense of the teams that have available cap space. It seems that there are going to be seven teams in the NBA that will have cap space this summer. Uh, the number you see with the Knicks that this is from Keith Smart, who, um, has a great spreadsheet yes. online. He's, He's actually working for Spotrack very soon in terms of their contracts and whatnot. He has the Knicks at $51.3 million. Um, basically, the way it works for him is he has the Knicks uh, making Mitchell Robinson a free agent and renouncing Vildoza and Pell. He also has a different number for Julius Randle. Um, very quick side note is that Randall's bonuses were each $945,000, yes. which somehow does not add up to the number that Spotrack has. They have it as a larger number regardless. Um, these are all, you know, kind of fungible numbers that can change. For example, the Mavericks, it says that they have $34 million in cap space. That's not really true because if Josh Richardson opts in and they don't let go of um, Tim Hardaway Jr., Tim Hardaway Jr. they yeah. have no cap space. None. So they're not Zero. even on this list. Right. Not and other teams can <laughs> do sign-in trades and whatnot. But so a quick aside to to DeRozan now. And, uh, wait, actually, could you go back for half a second? So for anybody listening on the podcast that doesn't see, after the Knicks are the Spurs, Thunder, as the aforementioned Mavs, um, aforementioned Raptors, Grizzlies, and Hornets. A couple things to note just very, very, very briefly. A lot of these teams are not free agent destinations. And aside from that, if you're a team like the Thunder, who wants to go play for? I mean, no, no offense against the Thunder in Oklahoma City and the fine, fine people of, of that city and state. Um, I, I don't think a ton of free agents are knocking down the door. So it just again, if you're thinking about this as a Nick fan, big picture wise, I think the takeaway is like that. In, I know it's a weak free agency, but as far as that goes, the Knicks are in a vastly, vastly better position than pretty much anyone else out there. That's all I want to say. Yeah. And one thing to add as well, and I'm not sure why Keith didn't include it, but uh, well, I guess I know why it's Lowry Markkinen, but the Bulls are another team and they are a big market that can create a lot of cap space for a player like Alonzo Ball or really yes. anyone else to fit in with Zach Levine and uh, Nikola Vucevic. They also have some moving pieces if they wanted, like Al Farouk Aminu's expiring contract. Do they, they want to eat things? Do they want to eat six million dollars worth of Dad Young, who was arguably the second best player right. last year? It's like it's a little funky right but so they're a type of team where they're not as good as the knicks but they can try to say look we're you know we just want to build around levine anyway we don't have to get the best players but we want to get good players and then yeah go from there and you know so a lot of moving pieces here um yes. but to go back to derozan uh you had said if memory serves about i think you said three years and 50 million dollars for him and then two years we should say two years and 50 million dollars for kyle lowry which i just uh one quick note on that i was listening to uh the always enjoyable who collective podcast uh that brian winhorse does and they were talking um again this is 
Thursday of uh, the week before you're listening to this about how one of the things that scared off teams in the Kyle Lowry trade uh, sweepstakes, was it a sweepstakes? I don't know mm-hmm. they call it a sweepstakes trade market um, was that they were afraid of what the number was going to take to get him next year. So I think someone had vaguely reported two for 50 at some point. Um, maybe that's a low number. I don't know. Maybe he wants a third year. Maybe if it's two, he wants two for 60. We don't know. We're just kind of assuming. So we're going with two for 50. And then, yes, the DeRosa number was same num- same money, uh, $50 million, except over three years. Right. So when we do that, that's basically it. That's the summer. Um, I mean, you can obviously have more parts if you wanted to get rid of Derek Rose, then you could open up about $12.6 million in cap space. Same thing with Vildoza, um, those two. I mean, th- there are ways around it, but that's essentially what they're looking at. Um, and so, you know, I mean, that's, I, I think what you're saying is is apt in that you, you're you not going to box yourself in this way, most likely. There are ways to get out of a player like DeRozan's contract. We saw it even in Toronto when they got out of it pretty easily and they brought in Kawhi yeah. Leonard. Uh, the question for me is more, you know, you'd said that DeRozan probably wouldn't be a, a first, second, or third option. He'd be a fourth option. I'm still skeptical at that because DeRozan has always been on the guy on his teams, the primary scoring option. Can I give and you a crazy one? Sure. Slide into the Manu role with the Spurs. Six man comes off the bench, essentially is their third or fourth option, but he, you know, you, you could slide him into some, I, just, just a thought. That's all. Yeah. No, I, I guess in that case, maybe you'd probably, I don't know, you try to get someone like Reggie Bullock back on the room exception. If there's space for him and he doesn't get more money elsewhere, then you slot him in um, to go along. Maybe you Barrett draft, again. maybe you trade up. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Someone like a Moses Moody type, some sort of wing player who can yeah. play alongside RJ. Yeah, it's definitely an option. Maybe you elevate Vildoza even. I mean, I I think that's a pretty small backcourt, but there are a lot of things to go about it. But yes, that it will not lock you in. It should generally be fine. I just, you know, I, I don't know. Like, we, I just was on Locked On Next earlier today and we're talking about like, oh, can the Knicks be like next year's Hawks? Or sorry, no, can... Yeah, can the next be next year's Hawks? And my answer was like, no, because the Knicks don't have Trey Young or that there's nobody of that ilk. But like, man, if you're if you're if you're going for the for the 04 Pistons, uh, you know, mojo, um, you could do worse than a team with Lowry, Randall, the Rosen, Barrett, Derek Rose, year two Obi Toppin, year two Emmanuel Quickly, Mitchell Robinson. Like, maybe you nail the draft pick. Maybe you get someone else on the like. You know, you could talk yourself into it, Jeremy. I, 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 well, maybe I could talk myself into it. Maybe, maybe you're le- less gullible than me. Well, but here's the thing, right? The, that Hawks team. Let's look at it. You said Trey Young, absolutely right. Yeah. But a lot of their best performers are also guys in their mid twenties, early yeah. mid twenties. And here we're getting a 35 year old Kyle Lowry and DeRozan. I want to say is 32. And. And that's deceiving because he came into the league. I believe he was 19. Um, right. He was a kid and there's a lot of, he played a lot early on. Like there's, it seems like he's on not the back nine. He's on like the back. He, he can see the clubhouse uh, from where he is. Right. And so that's the concern where again, it's like you, you, the Hawks have a lot of these great contracts and young players on rookie deals. And then they they're deep, but they also got Bogdanovich and Bogdanovich compared to someone like DeRozan. There's no competition. Like, if we're even talking about the idea of DeRozan being a sixth man, we're not talking about Bogdanovich being a sixth man. We're talking about him no. being the staple of a really good backcourt. Yep. So I, I don't, I don't think that I'm trying to say, I think the best blueprint, if you wanted to do something like that would be if you, if you brought in someone like Lonzo, but again, not in that lead positioning, but that mindset of like, if we wanted to attract expensive starting caliber talent that can elevate from there, that's a better argument than if you're if you're thinking of the Hawks route than something yeah. like this. I'll I'll say this though, and I, I, this I, this is a hill I, I think I will die on. Um, I think this the Larry DeRozan combo specifically because people will be hesitant to pay d- definitely DeRozan, but maybe Lowry too, big money because of the reasons you just spoke about, and you're not wrong. This is the the route to getting the most improvement, the most on-court improvement for next season might not be the best move 
for, again, lots of reasons. But if you're like, how can the Knicks get the best for next season? I think this is the way to go. Doesn't mean it's necessarily the right move. Right. And their exit plans that, that I'm not super worried about. Um, yeah. So, yeah, basically in terms of how it would look in general, uh, the Knicks would probably enter the season following the 2022-23 season over the cap, which means they would have their mid-level exception and they could use that. So yep. um, pretty standard stuff, especially after discussing a lot of the Lonzo comparisons from last week. But yeah, it's it's um, pretty straightforward. The only real option I think is that, well, actually they could potentially, it all depends on Derrick Rose too and any trades they make because a big reason why they would be entering over the cap is Kevin Knox and his cap hold. But if Kevin Knox is no longer here and you renounce that, you actually open up some cap space. Um, then that's when you might start to think of if we wanted to package uh, we, if you're the Knicks, yeah. you know, DeRozan and um, any other salaries that are there to try to bring in some sort of player and a sign and trade, you know, regular trade, uh, whatever it may be. I, I wonder if DeRozan, how much last thing before we move on to our next player, how much more, Appealing, if at all, would DeRozan become to you if the third year was guaranteed for, say, oh, I don't know, six million dollars? Does it make a difference to you? I think more so. Again, it's not the thing is that by the third year, that's not really the important year because that's there's the cap space is going to be. It makes it easier to trade though next if you need to make a trade next summer. It, it makes it easier to make the trade. It does. It still just concerns me because if, if his contract or if he becomes at a point where it's better to buy him out, then another team is saying, well, now we have $6 million less to spend and we did you a favor to get that. It is salary relief. Oh. I, I understand that. I don't think he'll even get to that point. I think he'll still be a productive player even on the third year of that contract. Um, but I guess at that point, it's really just, you know, you're hoping it's salary filler at the that's what on draft day, but no, that's what I'm thinking is like, is a team going to be able to look at him and be like, all right, it's a fair number. He'll help us this year. You know, it, it, you know, not too hard to get out. All right, let's move on. Uh, should we move on to our next player? Sure. Okay. So the next player, um, again, we're sticking with the, um, Lowry connections. So for anybody who's not on Twitter, uh, there was a clip that made the rounds from, um, well, we should just say his name, Josh Hart. Uh, he has a podcast, um, which he had Kyle Lowry as a guest on um, a week or so ago. And um, Josh Hart essentially said that he had, he had heard, I guess, that Tom Thibodeau wanted to um, pick him uh, the, the year that Hart came out in the draft, and I, I might, if I did my homework correctly, it would have been with the the nineteenth pick, which I believe, or sixteenth pick, whatever 16th. it was, that would eventually was chosen or used to select uh, Justin Patton, who I, I believe is no longer in the NBA. Um, was he in Westchester last year? Yes, he, he was. He had a cup of coffee with Westchester. He yeah. was with the bu- uh, in the bubble, and then he got signed to a two way. Yes, I think he did get like signed to or something. I think. Something like that. Anyway, uh, shout out to uh, Justin Patton, wherever you are. Anyway, so um, he there's a connection there with Tibbs, and then uh, Lowry followed up that little uh, exchange by saying that Tibbs is, uh, I don't know, he said something nice about Tibbs. So uh, clearly they're friends because they podcast together. So obviously everybody who podcasts together is, is very good friends, as we are proof of, uh, first and foremost, Jeremy. I see that <laughs> Jeremy's like, just, you can see Jeremy's face when I say that. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, Jesus. Here we go. Um, one other quick note is yes. they both went to, they're both uh, Vildoza. Nova. Yes. Vil- uh, Vildoza. Villanova. God, I got Nick's on the brain. They're both from Villanova. Yeah. So that's a huge. So point. we're sticking with two for 50 for Larry. What did I say for Josh Hart? Oh yes. Three, three for 40. Um, so Josh Hart, we should say, is a restricted free agent. Um, my God, I should know this. Is there? I'm sure there's someone who did this. Has anyone, quote unquote, stolen a restricted free agent away since Timmy in the NBA? There has to be one, right? Yeah, sure. Bogdanovich. Oh, yeah. Well, but yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, Sac- that's Sacramento and Sacramento didn't know, like, Everybody looked at Sacramento like, why are you not matching on this? And we still don't really have an answer, but whatever. Yeah, Bogdanovich. Okay. I, um, I mean, another one, this turned into a sign and trade, but Brogdon, when he went to Indiana. Oh, yeah. Um, but they didn't there. want to pay him that money. 
Well, the Bucks, right? The but, Bu- yeah, the Bucks didn't want to pay. But, I mean, I mean, yeah. the Hawks didn't want to pay uh, Hardaway, and the Kings didn't want to pay Bogdanovich. And usually, when they let talent go like that, it's I guess more financial just, than anything. So, I wonder. Do you think this is a fair number? Three for forty for Josh Hart. I think so. I mean, again, it's it all depends on what the deal is. Uh, and, and Andrew's saying, yeah, I mean, you could say D'Angelo uh, Russell, but I think that's a different story just based on the fact that it involved a Kevin Durant sign and trade. It was more yeah. of a formality than, than the Warriors being like, we love D'Angelo Russell. It was, we want something out of this because we're about to lose Kevin Durant for, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, and now they have the seventh pick of the draft okay, because they flipped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah zero for pretty good trade. Yeah. Um, I think that the thing about Hart, and this is why I kind of had my prediction being that the Pelicans are going to, uh, or, going, or that the Knicks rather are going to get uh, Bledsoe or Hart in some capacities. Their salary complications there. I just like, if they're keeping Zoe, which I think they're more likely to do with everything with Zion, then one of, one of Bled or Hart has to go. And it's this idea of, okay, well, are you going to pay Hart, you know, upwards of $13 million to stay? Are you going to pay Bledsoe to go away? How is that going to work? If we're going to assume that Hart, you know, wants a new change of scenery, wants a place to start. I mean, not that the Pelicans would care if Josh Hart wants to start somewhere else, most likely. They certainly didn't care about J.J. Reddick's demands. Well, he didn't start this year, we should say. He only started four games out of 47. Right. So, you know, I, I think that, you probably have to pay more, but it's this idea then of like how much really is too much for a player like Josh Hart. He's a fine shooter. He's, he's adequate enough. Well, um, we should say this year he, he did drop. So he was came out of the gate flying, shooting to 40% from three. And then the last three years, 33%, 34% last year, 32%. That said, somebody's as a shooter is not just what they are from behind the arc. Effective field goal percentage the last two years over 53. It's a really good number because he's really good from two point range. Now, how much do you value that if you're the Knicks or, or, Pelicans for that matter. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And I want to say he did fine from at least one of the corners last year. He did a pretty good job. Uh, um, I'll look it up right now. But yeah, uh, I think the other thing is that defensively, he's quite good. This is probably why Tibbs was attracted to drafting him in the first place. This idea of um, how he just, he plays bigger than he is. And eight rebounds a game. He's Yeah. I was going to say he's a great rebounder. Um, he's one of those players where he really doesn't need the ball that often. I think he's a solid addition. I wouldn't say that he's necessarily, you know, plan A or plan B, but there's a lot to like about what he does. And then when you see the fit and how that works, Knicks desperately need uh, talent at the wing as well as uh, the lead ball handler spot. So it could see, it could, it's easy to see how he would fit in there. Um, you were thinking, you were clearly, you were thinking of the year before from the corners when he shot 44%. It's not both corners. There's one corner where he's oh, it's pretty only- good <laughs> and one where he's not. If you check, uh, stat muse and this shot chart there from last season, I that's, think it's, that's rep- too fancy uh, for me. I, I I'm okay, a simple cleaning cool. the glass denizen. <laughs> he was, he only shot 68 corner threes last year. He made 19 of them for 28%, but that's like 68 is not a really large sample size. Um, he was hurt too. Yeah, I hurt his thumb. Yeah, right? I, I'm almost willing to take this year from Josh Hart and not toss it out the window completely, but just be like, you know, this was a guy who everybody agreed almost universally was like, this is a guy that is going to help you win basketball games. And then last year, like, it's one, I, I just, we could look at that New Orleans situation in general, which is like, it, that's actually, we didn't really talk about it, but that might be the best Lonzo Ball argument for like who was really going to look great in that situation last year, but I digress. Um, I think this is not, I I think this is with, I think this is more likely to happen than the DeRozan Lowry combo. I would agree. Yeah. I, and I don't, this is cool because it's another young player and it's a young, a young player who's not going to break the bank. And you're probably always going to be able to get out of this money. But like, I say that, and then I'm like, God forbid Josh Hart comes out of the gate and he's shooting like 32% from three through 40 games next year, and everybody's like, uh, the Knicks have this guy for how many more years and how much money? That's my only fear. I wish I, I wish I was a little bit sure about the shot. That's all. Yeah, well, I think the one thing about Hart compared to someone like DeRozan is it reminds me more of the Hardaway deal, which is that you're at least betting on upside, whereas for DeRozan, you're betting most of the time is past. Yeah. So, um, 
that type of thing where, yes, I mean, Hart would have to be severely injured uh, and his shot isn't falling, period. His defense is falling off. All these things. And I, you know, I, I don't think you can't go into the contract necessarily thinking that, especially when that player has been fairly healthy over the majority of their career. Yeah. So I think it's a worthwhile bet. It's just um, I, I'm curious as to how it fits into what their grand plan is because you can trade pieces around him and still keep him. But he's also that great trade salary if you wanted it where yeah. he he helps you with matching. He just adds another... Fun, fungible. Fungible. Right, exactly. Adds another layer of talent to your team that you then have at your disposal and, and try to move that should that be um, what you want. In theory... If they got Hart and they like could package those picks to get up and get like a Moody, and all of a sudden you're looking at this team with like all of these big wings who could do some different stuff, and it's like that's kind of where you want to be, right? In the NBA yeah. today, um, maybe pick up Trey Murphy the third. That could be nice too. You know, little just peppering wings in here and there. All the wings, give us all yeah. the wings. Um, Take these broken wings and learn to fly again. That could work. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Speaking of wings, we have one more. <laughs> uh, yes, we do. Uh, and and the finances for oh yeah, uh, Josh Hart and the team, it's basically the same in terms of DeRozan. It's really not that far off um, for what we just talked about. Same thing, Kevin Knox, you remove his cap hold. You can create more cap space that way. Poor but. Kevin Knox. Or Kevin Knox, yeah. Well, we we for, for the breaks. Yeah, we have to keep that seven because seven. I am sure. I am sure the Knicks are going to keep that seventeen million dollar cap hold on. The oh books. yeah, it's well, when he's going to get the max, and <laughs> then they'll use that cap hold to basically help propel him uh, in a lot of ways. We'll be like, oh, we saved uh, eleven million dollars that we would have had to commit to Kevin Knox here. So yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, okay, speaking of wings, uh, last but not least, uh, I. Jer- I misinterpreted this exercise at first and Jeremy was like, no, think of a star that you could trade for. I'm like, oh, I could trade for people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, it's- uh, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's go bigger. Go home. Kyle Lowry, meet your new teammate on the Knicks. Bradley Beal. Um, Bradley Beal. Speaking of guys who have struggled hitting the three for the last couple of years, I, I feel like I've mentioned this on the pod, it, maybe in passing, but I do just want to say explicitly. For as much as everybody and their mother is ready to, I, well, I don't know, maybe they're not ready to do this, but it seems like everybody and their mother is ready to give up all of the picks and, and everything, all the young players and all the picks for, for Bradley Beal. Bradley Beal over the last three years from three has shot, and I, I get the degree of difficulty on these shots and the team's not been great, but 35%, 35%, 30, well, last year was 349 but essentially three straight years of 35% from three. Um, you know, I just think it's worth noting. That's all. That's all. That's, I just want to say that. So, uh, Jeremy, how are we getting Bradley Beal here? Well, I, I do want to say this. I mean, Devin Booker, for example, not a great three point shooter. If you look at the numbers, but he's able to do a lot more and Beal's yeah. similar. I think if Beal didn't have to be the primary focal point to such a degree sure. on his team, like he often is, I and mean, he has Westbrook too, but that creates its own problems in a lot of ways where uh, I think it'd be a, a little bit easier for him. But in terms of how it works with Beal, so if I'm working within the confines of the $25 million that John uh, was kind enough to give me, we basically then need to pull off a trade. I mean, we would have to anyway, but the numbers get a little bit crazier. So the interesting thing about Beal is I was looking at the track record for players who have really a year's worth of time left. I mean, Beal has a player option for the following season, but he's likely to decline it because he'll be a 10 year veteran. He can get that 35% max. But in terms of the stars of recent years who have been able to get out of their deals with only essentially a year remaining, it's like Paul George, when he went from the Pacers to the thunder Mm -hmm. Kawhi, when he went to the Raptors and Anthony Davis, when he went to the Lakers. Yeah. Um, and they're all fascinating because, first of all, all three of those players uh, at those points, and even probably now, uh, has been better than Bradley Beal currently is as well. So if we just want to take a look at those trades, I mean, the the Paul George trade was Oladipo and Sabonis. Uh, 
the Kawhi trade was DeMar DeRozan, uh, Pirtle, I think what turned out to be the 27th pick in the draft, which then was uh, Johnson. Yes. And also Danny Green going in the trade. Yep. And then Anthony Davis was Ball, Ingram, Hart. And all the picks. Picks and a bunch. So my thought process here is like, well, the Knicks don't have an Oladipo that they're going to give up. Uh, They don't really have a DeMar DeRozan, and they certainly (sighs) don't have uh, the ability to give up all of their core for Bradley Beal. I mean, they could, but that would be absolutely ridiculous. So how do you find the right match? And for a lot of it, it was really just, okay, well, this is the salary that works, like getting rid of Emmanuel quickly in this case. Uh, Obi, Toppin, Kevin Knox. Uh, You'd probably have to either trade Vildoza or just non-guarantee him to to make room um and then you have to figure out other picks you know are you giving the 19th pick here because that works with the math are you giving the your 2022 pick are you giving one of your 2023 picks which you can do because you have the mavericks pick at your disposal so you're allowed to trade in consecutive years that way like all of these things and then you think about would the wizards even accept something like this would it have to be a three-team deal because that package is not, you know, that package wouldn't have gotten you any of those other three stars that I mentioned. But again, Bradley Beal isn't as good as those other three stars. So, well, how, it, you know, it, how you work it out is is a little tricky. Just very briefly, we should mention the Pacers and the um, Spurs. Well, the Pacers were pilloried for that trade when it happened. There was revisionist history after Oladipo then immediately turned into an All-NBA level player. But at the time, they're like, really? This is what you got for for Paul George? And then obviously Sabonis as well has turned in. But remember, Sabonis was coming off a rookie year in Oklahoma City where he did nothing. He was like a four spacing four who couldn't hit the three. Um And then while the Spurs did not necessarily get dragged through the mud on the Kawhi deal, I think everybody pretty much agreed like, This was the best trade available for Kawhi freaking Leonard. Um, And then the the AD trade was the AD trade. I, I, I don't, I'm really curious that that this this is a longer discussion. What the, what league wide consensus is at this point on both, both quickly and top but more so top because I, I, we're all high on him. I wonder if people around the league are like, yeah, this guy might be a decent NBA player or he might be like a bust. Um, I don't know. And then qu- quickly, same thing. I, I, here's why I don't think this is going to happen because then what do you do with Westbrook? So you got Westbrook there. You got Bertans with all that money. Um, you, like I feel like you'd have to find a home for Westbrook and like who's, who's taking Russell Westbrook right now. I don't know who that team is. Uh, so I, I do think this is unlikely, but it just, so you think it is possible if the wizards were to entertain this, this, this like trading deal? I mean, I guess I don't, I don't even think that the Knicks would necessarily go about this route. I think that they'd probably, I don't think rather, they would either. Right. I think, th- and in terms of Obi, you know, I think that he's the type of player where even though he's 23, he needs another year. And maybe he can build more value in that sense. And he comes into his second yeah. year, uh, his dad year, nonetheless. So having a child, maybe that also uh, oh, helps him like yes. it did with so many other players as well. So many. Um, being able to, to improve on what he's done and really grow out his abilities. So, you know, I mean, Obi has potential for sure, but a lot of that is wrapped up in like, okay, well, he just, he's, he's only played one year if you give him that chance to demonstrate it, like how we thought John Collins was just kind of like a no defensive player who yeah. he's not going to help you with the winning team. And now the Hawks as yeah. it currently stands, as we're recording this are three wins away from making the NBA finals. Yeah. So a lot can go into it. And then as well, if these players like Obi, if quickly any of these guys is able to further build out their talent, then that's also less money or less talent that has to go out which is great because then you can save your, uh, your assets in other ways and, and try to go around with it. But I, I don't think it'll happen. But again, I, since I we're, think, we're trying to be creative and, and yeah, fun, this is it. I don't think it's going to happen either because I, I feel like if Washington was, was going to trade, like why, why now? Why is Washington going to trade Beal now after resisting the urge to trade Beal last offseason, after resisting the urge to even like th- – unless it was reported and I missed it, they didn't 
Like there were no discussions before this trade line. They're like, we're not trading Bradley Beal and they didn't entertain it. Um, so I, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not, man, would the Knicks do this? There's I one gen- reason, by the way, why they do it. It's if Beal says, I'm done. I, you know, this has been fun. It's just not the right time for me. And I want to help you because I want to, I'm, I'm loyal and I want us to find the yeah. right home for me uh, in general together. That's the only reason I could see it necessarily happening. Yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is like, there aren't, I, I don't think there are nearly as many quote unquote obvious uh, Bradley Beal trades as it sometimes gets like, made out that there could be like the, the, you know, the big, the big ticket um, markets like don't have um, like Brooklyn's locked in. The LA teams are pretty much, well, the Lakers aren't locked in, but they just, they don't have the assets. Um, I guess you'd say Miami does have a, a lot of room and, you know, they have Harrow and whatever, but like they don't, it can't really trade a lot of picks. Um, so it would depend on what Washington is prioritizing. Like you do have the bulls there, but the Bulls cashed in, you know, their chips for Vucevic. Do they have any, enough left for for Bradley Beal? I mean, maybe Patrick Williams pops, but like he doesn't have that value right now. I, I just don't see, I just don't see the obvious team um, out there unless I'm unless I'm missing something um, for who who would. So I, I actually think this offer would have would have legs. Um, I'll say this: I think the one team that. I think I don't necessarily see it as a realistic option, but I think a lot of their fans might is the Celtics clearing Kemba Walker's salary and trying to make it more palatable. And they, they can create not max cap space, but kind of get there where I could see them at least trying to make that push, obviously Tatum and Beal go way back to their St. Louis upbringings. And so it'd be Brown. Whatnot. Brown would be the centerpiece. I would imagine in that case, but it, does it have to be Brown or, or if it's in well, free it's agency, Brown, is it a sign and trade? Well, but in the sense of, you know, I mean, if they well, have listen, enough salary to go out and if they wanted to it, got if all Bradley their picks, Beal, they could figure out a way around it. It's just sure harder to do. If Beal gets the free agency, that's that's going to be wild. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, that's going to be a lot of fun. I just I don't know. What would the, uh, Beal, Lowry, Randall, Barrett? You still got Mitch here. Still, you kept Rose. You still kept the draft pick. We'll see what happens with that draft pick from this year. Um, that's a it's a decent. Team. It's decent it's, enough where if you, you know, if this is the decree and building around it, I think you can figure out a way to get a pretty good top seven um, and then add, you know, some with the room exception, add some minimum players like Taj, for example, even though I don't see him getting too many minutes, but that sort of thing where you're, you're at least building towards something. Um, yeah, I, I I'd, I'd want to see this team play. I'll say that. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that's it on Mr. Beal and Mr. Lowry. Um, I, Oh, uh, here's the big overview. Anything we need to touch on here? Uh, basically it? just, if you acquire Bradley Beal, you're essentially committing to not having cap space for a for, while, which yeah. is fine. If that's, if you think this is your, your team to go for. And that's that. That's fine. Um, yeah. I don't think the Knicks would worry about that. Um, but uh, we'll we'll see. Um, I stand by what I said before. I think the heart combo with Lowry. If I actually had to, if I, if you gave me like a hundred different, like the Knicks are going to sign two guys in free agency, and you gave me a hundred different combinations of possibilities, I think Lowry and Hart would probably be my top twenty. I don't know if they'd be my top ten because I still, I still can't figure out if they're going to go for it. I think the Knicks are going to do something. We're, gonna, we're all going to sit here and be like, wow, we've never discussed this once. That's yeah. what I think is going to happen. Anyway. Um, final thoughts from you, Jeremy? Gosh. Um, no, I mean, I, again, I, I agree with you. I think that they're going to come out with something totally out from left field. It's yeah. so easy for us to sit at our computers and be like, these are the available options. And then the Knicks are the ones who are talking and speaking with agents and have a much better lay of the land for yeah. talent than we do. And they're saying, no, no, no. Like for example, and I know this is uh, by the time people hear this, if they listen to pod Strickland, I'm sure that they would know this, but, but this idea in mind of, um, cause, cause they'll discuss it, but we, we can too, for just a moment. <laughs> if with the thunder f- uh, falling in the draft lottery, Yes. How does that impact them? Because Shea has to play and they were very good when Shea played. And when he didn't, they were terrible. 
are they going to keep working for that? How are the contracts going to line up? So it's like that type of mindset where it's, how are you able to to build around him? Do you shop him? If you shop him, where does he go? What teams, you know, are willing to pay for him? All these different things. And, and it's next to impossible for us. And the other thing too, is as the combine goes on, it's easy to, to forget, I guess, that with Walt Perrin, he and the Jazz, he secured the meeting and the workout for Donovan Mitchell. Yep. No one had a clue about it. And then they traded up to draft him. So uh, it's a little different than the interview process. Interviews are obviously their own category of things, but yep. there's a lot of secret things and uh, some things leaked to the media for sure last year, some of it. Uh, was beneficial to help the Knicks, but there's always an agenda behind why someone leaks something. And the less we know, the better, I would say. I'm down with office. that. I'm, I'm okay that. not knowing. And then when things happen, we can talk about it from there. I, I love it. Um, thank you again, Jeremy. You're, you're, I mean, in all seriousness, you're, you're amazing with these things. Um, Andrew, anything before we uh, get out of here? I uh, just wanted a quick producer corner question for you two if you sure. had to put a percentage between what is more likely the lonzo plan or the lowry plan what does that poll or pie chart look like um gosh any scenario in the lonzo plan or any scenario in the lowry plan and i should know like we as you can tell this is a very planned out podcast we have more plans coming in the next few weeks i I, I can't mentally get around the notion of the Knicks signing a point guard to play for Thibodeau who just refuses to, to drive mm. and shoot at the rim and not get to the line. It, he's like, I, ju- I can't mentally, I cannot get around that simple fact. And um, so for that reason, I would say Lowry and I guess, you know, Hart would be the most likely one. So pie chart, you go like 70, 30, 60, 40, 65, 65, 35. Okay. Out of these two, I guess. Yeah. Jeremy. I just want to add one thing in based on what you're saying, John with Lonzo, because I know that also some people came away feeling like, well, you know, like Julius Randall turned into this player and you would have traded him for, you know, some basketballs and and a second round pick, that sort of thing. I think the other thing with Lonzo is, and, and I'm speaking personally is for four seasons i looked at frank nilakina and said oh you know if he just drives more <laughs> if he just does this does that does whatever that's fine and i'm not comparing lonzo to frank no. in terms of talent but it's this idea of a lot of times you know players can be who they are and it's hard for them to maybe overhaul their games to such a degree like for randall he became a different player because he improved glaring holes that were more realistic like a, a passing out of double skill. teams or yeah. right, like, things that that you can kind of nurture along the way if you are maybe not the drive and kick point guard if that's not like your go-to move that's a complete shift in your mentality but you know maybe that's the way he feels maybe he can he feels he is a drive and kick point guard and no one's given him the opportunity as a result for this i think that thibodeau who desperately wants to win now and the fact that Lowry can go wherever he wants and Lonzo would have to force New Orleans's hand. Yep. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go 75 Lowry, 25 Lonzo. I get the sense that Tibbs would, would love to have Lowry more than anything on his team. And I'm sure he likes Lonzo, but I'm sure he looks at Lowry's like, this is a guy who will help me from day one, knows how to run an offense tight with a lot of people. Yep. He, like, you know, he helps restructure us and rebrand us even more. So um, he's not young in the sense of like a, what a rookie how that would affect leading the team and um, and, and at the point guard spot. So I think it's got to be that. I agree. Somewhere I'll go in the middle. I'll say, because you said 70, 30 or 75, he said 75. 75. So I'll go 70, 30. There you John go. Said 65, Perfect. 35. Which there of course go. means that Lonzo Ball is not going to be a Nick. Um. Yes. <laughs> well, the cra- you've got me now thinking about that crazy thing that we haven't discussed or even considered. Like all of a sudden LeBron is traded to the Knicks or something. We'll, we'll save that for we'll, we'll there, save there, that for another podcast. Plan 5.0 of yeah, Cap or No Cap. LeBron, uh, you can run home. that one. There yeah. you go. Um, on that I'll note, just the, I'll just be a, us playing Space Jam three, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> you know, I won't be watching it. Um, on that note, uh, thank you, uh, Jeremy. Thank you, Andrew, for your uh, outstanding production as always, and most of all, 
Thank you guys at home and guys and gals for for listening to another episode of the Knicks Film, po- Film School Podcast. Don't forget, give us a rating, a review. Tell your friends, your 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 family. Tell tell strangers on the street about us and all the things that we do. We got a new um, Brock Hard shirt merchandise. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yes, we, we do. do. Um, check for the link in uh, wherever you're watching this. It'll be right underneath you. And uh, we will be back with you with another episode before you know it.